All you have to want to do is to welcome someone and to do something for them. Uh, what a wonderful way to finish one of this striking set of stories which we have just watched and listened to and heard. <coughs> Watching these films in advance, something stood out for me. How similar these stories are. There are great resonances between them as well as the wider stories that the team have gathered across our three dioceses. And wonderfully, they merely touch the surface of something that's really happening and going on and continuing. Um, this is not something that's happening in isolation. These are not the only stories that can be told. There are countless stories, and the more these stories of encouragement are told, uh, the better the narrative will be across our nation. So there are many differences across the churches and communities that we belong to, um, represented here. Differences of denomination, but as Father Dominic was saying, this is a wonderful ecumenical gathering. Differences of style of worship, the quality of dancing and singing, um, and we are all from different parts of London and East Surrey. But the thread of welcome and of showing God's love shines through all these stories and binds us together in a community of solidarity and hope. Those two aspects are important. Solidarity, being willing to stand together, and also the community of help, hope that we are building. Uh, the beautiful booklets which are being published tonight start with a thought-provoking line by an American author and Roman Catholic, Donna Tartt. Stories are sailcloths that we hoist to catch a breath of the divine. There's almost a sense of the breathing of the Holy Spirit in that sentence, in those words. It is no accident that deep truths are so often illustrated through stories, whether in the Old Testament or the parables of Jesus, the greatest storyteller of them all. And these stories which we are sharing are themselves parables. The stories which we have been collecting here have some very British features. Offering a cup of tea as a token of welcome is a motif which recurs frequently. And in a moment of cultural connection, the British coffee morning in the story of St. Dunstan's Primary School in Cheam, translated into Cantonese as a tea gathering so that parents newly arrived from Hong Kong understand that it is a social gathering where the talking is more important than the drinks. All these stories of welcome are so much more than words and pictures on a page or screen. Uh, they are coming to life in are very engaging with them, and that is very wonderful. Every single story speaks of hearts that are open to the poor, the lonely, and the vulnerable, hearts that rejoice in helping and welcoming and reaching out to others, and hearts which are refreshed and renewed by loving service and unexpected blessings of friendship and connection. I want to thank especially tonight those who have so generously contributed to and shared these stories, their stories. We must make them our own stories and add to them. It takes great courage to share a story of adversity with dignity as you have done, Maimuna. And it is a privilege to hear and learn from those stories tonight. So the event tonight has had two purposes. Firstly, to celebrate stories of welcome, to notice and acknowledge how they reflect our churches as places where God's love abides, where God's love is found. St. Teresa of Avila said, Christ has no body now on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. And the volunteers shown in these films and clips and many other unnamed and unnoticed 
volunteers from across our diocese are living that out in very real ways as they welcome and serve people from all over the world. And in turn, they are granted that transformative power of an encounter with Jesus, who said, I was a stranger and you welcomed me, as Bishop Paul was saying from Matthew 25. Every time we welcome someone into our country, our church communities, our homes and our lives, we are welcoming Christ. This encounter looks different in different places. So the second purpose of tonight has been to show that everyone can be part of a story of welcome. In the videos, people speak about making small gestures, about offering a smiling, friendly face. Father Keith Baltrop speaks about finding these gestures in small ways, small gestures, like a vase of flowers. And the Reverend Linda Fox spells it out. It's nothing that requires great skill, but it's about seeing a person to whom you are connected. There's no great magic about it. Let's do it. <laughs> that is the only skill required to welcome, is that of wanting to welcome, and it has to come from the heart, of looking at each person as an individual and finding and seeing Christ in that individual. If you seek to do that, you can provide a welcome. And I thank you for the welcome and the spirit of welcome, which is abroad among us. Sadly, the United Kingdom today is not always a place of welcome. Too often there is a requirement to distinguish between people on the basis of their legal status, their sexual orientation, whatever difference it is, leading to wildly different support being available for people depending on where they have come from and how they got here. The Nationality and Borders Act, which became law earlier this year, sadly enshrines these distinctions in our legal system, making provision for some people to arrive safely and with dignity as resettled refugees, while others are left to make the journey a dangerous journey across the high seas, across the English Channel, in inflatable boats, only to be housed for months in hotel rooms, not allowed to work while awaiting a decision on their cases. This is not the compassion we expect to see from our elected government, a government which repeatedly talks about our proud history of welcome. We really can do better and we can encourage our elected representatives to be instruments of change, agents of change. With my fellow bishops in the House of Lords, last week I signed a letter calling on the government to end the policy of deporting asylum seekers to Rwanda. I thank God that the flight last week did not take place and as yet no one has been transported. That makes it a very costly and wasteful policy indeed. But the government remains determined to pursue this course of action. And as the bishops who signed the letter wrote, our Christian heritage should inspire us to treat asylum seekers with compassion, fairness and justice. As we have for centuries, they are the vulnerable that the Old Testament calls us to value. We cannot outsource our ethical responsibilities. Deportations are not the way. And I hasten to add, that is not about Rwanda. Um, Rwanda is hosting the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting this week. It is about us taking our responsibility for those who arrive on our shores here. It is not about outsourcing it. <laughs> By contrast, what is happening in the churches that we are celebrating tonight is the very opposite of this. And we can thank God for this. Uh, we can genuinely be thankful. 
Instead of outsourcing responsibility, everyone here is embracing it, and with it embracing those very asylum seekers that the government is seeking to send away. So there is a much, much better story to tell. We are already welcoming arrivals in significant numbers from Hong Kong, and many people have been queuing up in each of our communities, up and down the land, to welcome refugees from Ukraine and other troubled parts of the world. Ukrainian family I met recently, just days after they have made a difficult decision to flee from shelling in Ukraine. And the mother was saying, let's go down to the shelter. And the father was saying, if we don't get in the car and go, we might never get out. Um, imagine the dilemma of that. And three lovely children uh, playing in my garden in a wonderful, carefree way. Uh, w what a wonderful transformation is possible if we reach out a hand of friendship and a hand of help. So for those of us with privilege, it is essential that we speak out for the rights of those who are not privileged. As the great philosopher John Stuart Mill said in 1867, bad men need nothing more to compass their ends than that good men should look on and do nothing. Allowing for the gendered language of the mid-19th century, this is still true today.